Um, this is going to be the open jump assessment training course. Um, this course was offered last year and the year before, and, and it was open dump assessment training and open dump closure, but uh, this course is just going to be the open dump assessment training course. Okay, so uh, let me talk just a minute about uh, myself and uh, about why we're doing the open up assessment training co uh, course. Um, I've worked at Cherokee, uh, Cherokee Nation for approximately 27, 28 years. And during that time, I feel like uh, we've become pretty good at uh, assessing open dumps. Uh, I know a lot of you guys have open dumps at your uh, tribe and you do a lot of reviews of them and you look at a lot of dumps. So I feel like over this course of time that We've gotten pretty good at looking at dumps, but uh, there is a certain way of looking at them and assessing them. And I was kind of wanting today to just to go over some of the, uh, nah, I don't know, tricks and ideas and uh, some of the methods that we use uh, to assess our dumps. Um, I do have uh, a certification from landfill, uh, manager of landfill operations. I know it's not the open dump certification, but it is a certification for actually uh, uh, doing a actual uh, uh, approved landfill certification. So uh, I feel like between the uh, years of experience and looking at dumps and maybe some of the uh, landfill uh, training courses that I've taken that I, I have a pretty good uh, feel for open dumps. Um, I know that dumps are all kind of different. Each one of us has a different uh, land base, a different way of uh, of uh, interviewing people, a different way of assessing our dumps, a different uh, climate. We have a bunch of different uh, uh, ways of looking at them. So if there's something that I say today during the course that uh, you might be able to add some information to or to make it a little more interesting or a little more personal, feel free to chime in. Uh, most of my experience is from uh, here in Northeastern Oklahoma. Uh, we have a different climate than say uh, Western Oklahoma and a totally different climate than New Mexico. So uh, we all kind of will, we all know what trash is, we all know what an open dump is, but we all kind of look at them in a different way. So hopefully after today, we will be able to um, understand uh, what an open dump assessment is. We'll utilize a score sheet to kind of give us an idea of, uh, hey, look, this dump is, uh, a little more hazardous to the uh, environment and to people than another one might be. And then we also might want to talk about what we do on a site visit. Um, you know, with the pandemic and the way things have been going lately, site visits have kind of been out of the question on things. So part of this class was always a site visit. So what I'm going to do is instead of doing a site visit, of course, we're going to do a couple of examples of sites. So when the presentation is over, I'm going to give you a small exercise on five different sites and we'll just go over the sites and score the sites from the score sheet and just kind of look at them and see uh, how or why they came up with the score that they did. So that will be our mini field trip that we'll complete uh, virtually. So <clears throat> what is an open dump? I mean, you all have seen uh, trash piles on the side of the road. You've seen uh, uh, different uh, Uncovered, covered sites. Uh, you've seen miscellaneous trash thrown out of windows. Uh, open dump is really a very open ended statement, open ended question. Uh, all it really is is an uncovered site for disposal of waste without environmental controls. Uh, and the RICRA definition is uh, any site receiving solid waste that does not comply with subtitle D municipal waste landfill standards. Uh, if you're Cousin has a uh, property out in uh, the middle of the county and he allows people to dump on there and he says it's okay uh, and covers it up with a backhoe. That's still an open dump. That's not a, uh, a uh, solid waste landfill because it doesn't comply with the standards. Uh, so just because it's controlled or allowed by someone on their property does not mean that it is a, a uh, not an uncovered or a uh, open dump as defined by the definition. 
so, okay, the one on the left here, it's a pretty obvious that's an open dump. Uh, the landfill on the right is not an open dump because it's covered every day with daily cover. So, and that's pretty obvious and everybody pretty much knows that. Um, and we'll talk later about some of the different uh, open dumps and what might be contained in them. And sometimes they don't look exactly like people think or remember what an open dump would look like. So it's good to have different kinds of examples of the dumps just to force all to get an idea of how they might look differently from place to place. So why do we do open dump assessments? Uh, basically, there's three things that we look at when we do an open dump assessment. We want to rank the site. We want to assign it a score. By assigning it a score, we can prioritize the dumps. You know, a lot of us have a lot of dumps. Uh, just because a dump is giant or big in size does not necessarily mean that it is going to get a high score and be hazardous to the environment or to people. Uh, we want to prioritize these sites because uh, you know, we all have too many dumps and not enough manpower to clean them up and to uh, keep them from starting again. So we want to we want to rank them where we can prioritize them for cleanup, and we want to get as much information off of the dumps as we can. Uh, that helps us uh, gather the information and list the dump sites where we can put it on a database for others uh, to use in the different departments or even different tribal members might want to find out where the dumps are located. So here's the information that we're really looking for when we go out to a dump. And a lot of this stuff is common sense. We want to get an accurate location because we want to put GPS on there now. We don't have to, you know, give directions anymore. We can use GPS when we go out to a dump site. We want to kind of look at the contents. Uh, the more hazardous the materials are in the dump, the more higher, the higher it's going to score on the score sheet. Uh, we want to know the status of the dump. Has it been dumped in recently? Was it? last dumped in in 1957, uh, the, uh, the status of the dump will determine uh, a lot, has a lot to do with uh, uh, how we score it and then the size. Uh, but I, there's one thing that I do want to kind of emphasize to everyone is because just because the dump size is gigantic or large doesn't necessarily mean it's the, it, it's going to be the ha most hazardous to the environment or to the population that's around it. It has a lot more to do with uh, what's in the dump and the process of how it might move from the dump to affect people or the environment. So, the assessment score worksheet. Uh, I don't know if you guys have used the uh, assessment score worksheet or not before, but the IHS open dump survey form is what we use to score the dump sites. Uh, the score worksheet uh, it's just a solid waste form. Uh, you take it out into the field with you. You fill it out. You get a numerical score to each one of the different uh, assessment uh, categories on the sheet and give your dump an overall site when you're done. Uh, I'm not going to put an overall uh, sheet on here on the presentation, but uh, if any of you want a uh, copy of the score sheet or a blank copy, let me know, uh, put it in the comments or send me an email after we're done or any time, and I'll send you uh, some blank copies of the uh, IHS uh, waste survey form. Uh, or you can get it off the IHS uh, website also, but uh, I'd be glad to send it to you also. So, <clears throat> one of the main reasons that we collect the information on open dumps is because of the IHS uh, WSTARS tracking and reporting system. I know most of you have heard of this, I, you know, I don't know if you, you or your tribe are entering the information on the IHS website, but uh, the uh, tracking and reporting system is just a reporting system that IHS has a database that you can enter your information on your solid waste dump sites, and you can categorize them and keep them on the database for future use. And that way, when someone goes out to assess a dump, you can look on the uh, WSTARS database and see if your site's on there already. If it is, you have the information that you need on there and you don't have to reassess the dump site again. So the uh, WSTARS database is uh, collected by individuals, tribes, and uh, collected in one database, which is really a nice thing to have as one database for all the uh, solid waste sites on, on tribal properties. 
Uh, this is the website address for W Stars. It's uh, https://wstars.ihs.gov. You might want to go to that website and go ahead and log on. Get you a login uh, information. You'll have to uh, once you log in, you'll have to uh, send your login information to IHS. They will have to approve you and send you a password. Once you get that password, then you'll be able to enter information into the WSTAR database. Until you log in and get approval from the IHS local office, you won't be able to enter any information into the WSTAR database. Uh, when you pull up the database, it's basically going to look like this. This is going to be your home screen. Wherever you live at, say you live in New Mexico, you'll click on the Albuquerque area. If you live in Oklahoma, you'll click on the Oklahoma area. Uh, once you click on that, it'll pull up an email address for your local IHS uh, W Stars uh, uh, contact person. You will contact them saying, "Hey, I want to get on W Stars. I want to start in your information, or I want to look at my tribal information." They will send you a password. You can get on W Stars and look up all the information that they have on there for your tribe's uh, solid waste and or uh, other. And they also have other operation and maintenance data systems on there. Uh, like water lines, uh, sewage systems, stuff like that are also on the W Stars database. It's just some of the things that you can find on there. I'm I go on there mostly to look for official open dumps in Indian Country database, but it also has solid waste, water projects, and sewer projects on there. So it's a really good uh, database to get on and look and see if you're uh, concerned about a site and it's been around for a pretty long period of time. There's probably a period of time in the past that somebody's put that on the database. So you can get some basic information off of there. And you can always go on there and add your information that you might find or that you've updated to update the sites on your tribal properties to make them a little more up to date for right now. So I, I encourage everyone to get on the W Star database, get you a password, uh, learn to use it and uh, just uh, practice with it uh, like once a month, if you don't get on there at least once a month, your password will expire. So try to get on there at least once a month and look at your data and try to update your site. Um, so we just talked about this, um, the solid waste, water and sewer on there, and the sites are all prior to prioritized by an assessment score, low, medium and high priority. So uh, this is a good tool to find out if your site is a uh, something to look, uh, keep uh, working on or to go back and look at again if it's a higher priority uh, instead of a lower priority then you can just look on the database without actually having to go to the site which is uh, nice when you have a tribal area that can be pretty remote or pretty large so <clears throat> the open dump assessment we when we go out to a site there are factors of concern that we look at some certain things that we have to have on every dump if we're going to put it on the uh, w stars database if we're going to make a good a survey of uh, open dump when we go out. These are the things that we want to look for when we go out to a site. Uh, we, you want to give it a name. You want to have a unique name for it. You don't want to just call it uh, open dump one, two, three, whatever. Uh, we have found that if you use a real lead particular name or a name for from uh, something that that is uh, easy for everybody to remember. Uh, it really helps because uh, the database is large and if you put uh, just a dump with a number on it, uh, it will get confusing. So try to use a specific name as possible, a unique name when you go out to a site. Um, sometimes we use the name of the nearest community that is associated with the dump site. You know, example of a town or a creek or a county or a, a community building or a church. Uh, also, uh, it's important to us to know the name of the tribe and who has jurisdiction over the dump. So these are some of the first things that we do when we go to a site and look at an open dump. Uh, the geographic location. Now with uh, cell phones, you can get a GPS coordinate without even having to have a GPS uh, unit off of your phone. You can get a pretty decent uh, GPS coordinate. So you want to get that for sure. And of course, the state and the county. And a good description on how to get there from a known starting point. Uh, I think that this is one of the uh, most important things. Uh, some of these dumps are in really remote places, hard to find. To us, it's easy because we're all familiar with the property and we know how to get there. But try to write your narrative as someone that's never been to the site 
and make it as clear and as plain as possible to find the site because if uh, they're not from there or in certain times of the year, they're a lot easier and or harder to find. Um, okay, some more factors of concern. Uh, solid waste system type. Okay, uh, we have solid waste disposal sites, a collection system, transfer stations, uh, uh, transfer stations with uh, off reservation disposal, recycling facility, and construction and demolition debris landfill. These are the different kinds of systems that you'll see on the WSTARS database. You'll have to click one of these to be able to put the rest of your information in when you go on the database. Okay, so some more factors of concern. When you go out to a site and you look at a, a uh, open dump, uh, one of the first things you want to do is look at the condition of it. Uh, is it uh, buried open dump? Is it cleaned up? Is it closed? Is it still a surface open dump? Or has it been upgraded? Uh, the condition of the dump uh, is a important thing. Uh, a dump that's not really active, you will look at it in a kind of a totally different way than you will an active dump. And as far as your uh, assessment of it and how fast you want to work on it or clean it up or to characterize it will be determined by the condition of it right now. Um, the size of the dump, uh, we, you want to try to measure it as close to possible in square feet, yards, meters, uh, you know, um, estimated volume also in cubic yards. Sometimes the volume is a little hard to do on the sites because part of the sites will be covered up. You know, there'll be a lot of tree branches, limbs, um, different kind of things that are blocking some of your view on the cubic yards. Uh, most of the time when I go to a site, the surface area is pretty easy to do. You know, you can do the length times the width and the area is pretty easy to do. And then you can calculate the volume with this with a simple uh, uh, formula from the surface area, if you have an idea of what the volume is, uh, the size of it is. So uh, I think it's more important to get a, a rather uh, small, medium, large kind of thing on the open dump site than an actual uh, square footage down to the, you know, the square foot. Uh, I think we all can kind of tell whether a dump is large, medium, or small. Uh, you want to get a good, uh, as best you can on the surface area and volume, but don't spend a lot of time on the actual uh, surface area and volume size. Uh, spend more time on characterizing the actual uh, effects the dump might have. Um, I think some people get uh, kind of carried away by the size of a dump, and I know I've said it already a couple times on here, but uh, the uh, size and the volume are important, but not the most important thing that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, another factor of concern is uh, the frequency of cover. Is the dump covered daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, or never? Um, you know, most open dumps that I'm familiar with, and I know a lot of you are, are probably never covered. That's why we see them. They're open dumps. They're eyesores. They get trash thrown on them, you know, weekly or daily sometimes. They're rarely covered up. I think that uh, most of the time they're only covered up by nature and uh, the elements cover them up over time, not people actually. Um, so here's something else that uh, we've kind of added to our uh, assessment sheet too. We want to know if the site is on tribal trust land, individual trust land, individual ownership, tribal restricted land, fee lands, or if it's not known, we don't like to put unknown on there. It's uh, important to us to have one of these designations put on all of our sites. So uh, we talked about the uh, active and inactive a minute ago. It's pretty easy to tell on it, inactive or active. I mean, active dumps usually uh, you can tell when you go out by just the household trash, the uh, kind of uh, appearance of the trash being on top of the ground, uh, less rusted things, more uh, plastic bags. And you can see on the left here that that's an open dump, but it's really inactive. And the one on the right's active, and that, that's the ones that we see most of the time. Inactive ones get kind of covered up and get kind of uh, weathered after time, and are a lot harder to see when you're driving around or when someone calls in for a uh, you to go do an assessment on one. Okay, so uh, something that uh, has been coming up in the last few years is uh, evidence of meth lab waste on site. If you go out to a dump site and you see some of the following things, 
you might have an idea that there might be some uh, some uh, meth lab uh, waste involved in the dump. Some of the common things found are starting fluids, lye, muriatic acid, Epsom salt, coal tablets, energy boosters. Um, that's kind of like, uh, I guess, uh, <laughs> uh, monster drinks, uh, camp stove fuel, Drano, and then lab glass, corningware, uh, stuff you use. You just wouldn't usually find at a uh, a uh, solid waste dump out in the country. Uh, and if you find a lot of volume of these, you know, if you go to a site and you see 75 uh, containers of cold tablets empty, you kind of have an idea that, hey, they might be some meth lab stuff here. So be a little on the outlook, uh, look for that and be a little more careful if you start seeing some of these things, because some of these things can be a little hazardous. I know that the uh, PPE for going to dump sites is usually pretty low. But if you go out and the first thing you see are any of these kind of things that are meth lab contaminants, you might want to reassess your PPE on what you're going to use to assess the rest of the dump site. Uh, here's just a picture of a bunch of uh, peroxide bottles. So uh, these are just some of the things that you might see when you go out there. Uh, here's a sack with uh, that had some of the same kind of things in it. Uh, these are just. Uh, not necessarily saying for sure that it's a meth lab, but these are some of the common ingredients that you might find out there. Okay, so another factors of concern are just the contents of the open dump. The contents or what's in the dump will, will make a big difference on whether the dump is assessed as a low, medium, or high hazard. You know, most of the dumps that we find and we see 99% probably are just solid waste from household hazardous household waste. They're not hazardous. It's just household municipal. We call it municipal waste that people throw out of their houses. The other category is hazardous waste, and the other category is special waste. Um, municipal solid waste is what you usually see: Walmart sacks, uh, milk cartons, uh, beer cans. You know, this is what you usually see on an open dump when you go out. Someone just not wanting to pay for the trash service, and so they're going to. Uh, just uh, use a uh, an indention in the road or in a creek, uh, creek dry creek bed and use it for their solid waste disposal. It's usually commercial trash. Uh, hazardous waste is waste that uh, is defined by RICRA as hazardous. It can be a myriad of things, but it's not municipal waste. It's hazardous. It's it's considered hazardous waste. Special waste is like uh, household appliances. Uh, Roofing shingles, special waste are not household waste, but they're also not hazardous. Uh, car parts, uh, batteries. You you can see on the in this picture here that when you go to a solid waste site, and I know that most of you have seen this, that uh, you see household uh, a lot of household uh, municipal waste, but you also see quite a bit of this special waste, which is appliances and refrigerators and washers and dryers, because the transfer station will charge an extra fee. TVs to dispose of these things. So a lot of times these things get thrown out into the solid waste uh, dumps uh, because of the charge, the extra charge that you get when you uh, take these to the uh, transfer station. So uh, here's just another quick list of some of the uh, hazard factors that you will run into when you go to do an open dump assessment. I know most of everybody have seen these things before, but just look for some of these things. Look for abandoned uh, automobile parts. Look for electronics, fluorescent light bulbs, uh, lead acid batteries, uh, medical waste, uh, tires. You all, we all see tires on there, and I'll give you a uh, a uh, email address here in a little bit to uh, on who to call if you have scrap tires at your site. Uh, you'll see uh, uh, oil waste. Uh, you know, a lot of the tribes are in uh, oil country. You'll see oil waste. You'll see uh, Different things like uh, uh, sewage, sludge, septic tank pumpings. There's a myriad of things that you could find. Uh, this list is really not all inclusive, but this just is some of the things that are commonly found out there. And a lot of these things that you'll want to uh, put on your characterization, but then some of the things are just kind of uh, found at almost every site. Okay, so another factor of concern. And one of the easiest ones for us to do or to find when we go out to a site is the rainfall. Um, you know, every uh, every site that we go to 
it's pretty easy to look on your state uh, agriculture. Your, Oklahoma has a mesonet. Uh, you can find the uh, average rainfall for an area or for a county or for a site for every state. You can. It's easy to find the average uh, uh, rainfall for an area, and you can determine by that average rainfall amount uh, whether the site has a probability of runoff and or leaching into the groundwater by the rainfall amount. Uh, here in, in uh, northeastern Oklahoma, I mean, it says over 25 inches for high. We're never under 50 inches, so we we are uh, more than high on rainfall, whereas there's areas probably in New Mexico and western Oklahoma that are always in the low area or close to low. So the rainfall is one of the easiest factors to find, on, and it can be found easily on a chart for every site. So there was there's really no reason not to have the rainfall amount on each site. Okay, so another factor of concern is site drainage and leachate potential. Uh, the site drainage and leachate potential can be limited. It can be largely neutral, a pretty flat area. It can be uh, it can be a pretty uh, a open area, or it can be a uh, steep area that increases ground or surface water contamination. It can be an area with uh, clay, it can be an area with uh, sandstone, uh, or it can be uh, an area that actually protects the ground or surface water. So uh, site drainage and leachate potential are one of the things that uh, when you look at the site, you'll have to determine and use your professional knowledge to kind of determine whether the drainage and leachate potential is low, medium, or high. You can also go back to your office and look on the topographic map or Use drone footage also, which is something that we use quite a bit on most of our our uh, assessments and sites, uh, just to see what kind of a uh, topography that you have at the site and whether it will be inducive to uh, site drainage and or runoff. Uh, with the tools that we have nowadays, it's uh, pretty easy to determine whether you have uh, drainage or leachate potential for each site. Um, flooding potential. Uh, I think that we all know the areas that we have that are flooded and uh, how easily or likely something can move for flooded. Uh, you know, this time of year is pretty easy to tell on areas that can be flooded or have uh, rain inundation. It seems it seems like, uh, and it's just me, but I think everybody else would agree that uh, the uh, areas that we have a lot of uh, dumps in or low areas or areas in creeks or areas in depressions. So a lot of times those areas will flood and the trash will actually float or move around. And you, when you go to the site from one time to the other at different times of the year, some of the trash will be moved down or floated down or moved from one spot to the other. And that makes it pretty obvious for us to determine that, hey, look, there's potential for this to uh, move off site because of flooding or uh, uh, actual uh, uh, over abundance of rainfall. Um, some more factors of concern. Frequency of burning. It seems like everybody wants to burn uh, these uh, solid waste or open dumps because uh, burning is like uh, makes it go away evidently or makes it smaller or less obvious. So a lot of times these sites are burned uh, and burning is really uh, not the way to go on these sites. Uh, by burning them, you do release some uh, worse things into the air sometimes than you actually have on the ground. And uh, the last couple of weeks, there's been a lot of also a lot of fires. And uh, so we want to make sure that we write on our score sheet uh, if the site is burned, if it's burned uh, quite often, or if it's never burned. So that's just a factor of concern that we want to check on. Okay, another factors of concern is, is the site fenced or not? And the access to the site, the access to a site will make a big difference. Uh, if you have a gigantic dump that's totally accessed and controlled, it's less likely to impact human health and the environment than it is a small site that has total access to it. So you want to put on your score sheet, if it's effectively controlled, or if it's not effectively controlled, or if it's unrestricted access. Uh, I know almost all the dumps that we've ever cleaned up or are characterized here at Cherokee Nation, we've actually controlled the excess after we finished cleaning the dump and put up a fence and or signs. 
Uh, but most of the open dumps that we've had are open dumps because they're easily accessed. Uh, and that's why people use them. It's people uh, that dump trash. They're like everybody. They're like the rest of us. They can make it. The, they want the easiest possible, you know, so. Um, access will make a bigger or smaller score on your score sheet for sure, because uncontrolled access will score more points than controlled access will. Okay, so factors of concern for public concern also. Uh, we all have dumps that people call about and we've been to more than once. Uh, and they've people voice concern about the same uh, dumps over and over again. And uh, it seems like a lot of the dumps and uh, they get started uh, back in historical dumps. And over time, they just go and go and go and then they get cleaned up and then they'll start again because of the location. People are used to it. Families and generations sometimes use these dumps. So uh, we all know where the dumps are that people have concerned about and people uh, call about and ask about. So uh, factors of concern are important because public image is really important on open dumping, uh, outreach and getting people to quit doing open dump is one of the uh, most important things. I mean, once you clean up a dump to get people not to dump there again, is really something important. So you want to, to be considerate of the public's concerns uh, once you get a dump characterized and once you clean it up. So public concern is something else that we want to have as a factor on our score sheet. Uh, here's another one, it's really pretty easy. Distance to drinking water aquifer uh, and or drinking water system. Uh, greater than 600 feet will give us a certain score. 50 to 599 feet will give us a score. And then less than 50 feet, which basically means the dump is right on a drinking water source, will give us a much higher score. So a small dump less than 50 feet from a drinking water source is going to have a lot higher score than a large, gigantic two acre dump six, greater than 600 feet from a drinking water source. I hope that makes sense, but it's pretty obvious that it does. Um, another uh, health and environmental threat is the distance to surface water bodies. If it's greater than a thousand feet, you get a score. If it's five, if it's 50 to a thousand feet, you get another score. If it's less than 50 feet, you get another score. So the distance to surface water bodies will increase your score uh, quite a bit on these. Uh, and also, you know, I talked earlier about the exact measurements. You know, if something's 1,010 feet, I would consider it uh, maybe the same as 51 to 1,000. Uh, you're not going to be able to measure the exact feet unless you go back to your office and use GPS on there. If you're just out on the site and you're walking it, uh, these numbers are not uh, drop dead numbers. These numbers are for reference. So, uh, just remember that it, it's there uh, unless you're being able to get an exact number that uh, the numbers aren't uh, drop dead numbers on there for the actual feet. Uh, yeah. Public health and environmental threat, distance to homes. Um, hopefully most people that do uh, open dumps keep them away from houses because they want to do it where no one can see them and make them clean it up or to pick it up or to call in on them. But some of the dumps are closer to homes and by the distance to the homes, there's also a score that will increase or decrease on the score sheet. And you can see the numbers on here. 5,000 feet, 1,000 to 5,000 or less than 1,000 feet. Okay, so let's take a look at the actual uh, score sheet. So, when we score and rank a dump site, there are three different uh, scores or actual threat levels that we'll get. We'll get high, medium, or low. Okay, so if there's any slide that we've talked about so far in this presentation, this is the slide that I want you guys to concentrate on. This is the slide that actually gives us a score for the different uh, things that we've talked about so far, contents, distance to surfing water, site drainage, uh, leachate, rainfall, size, accessibility, uh, all of these things 
if you can look on here, the high, moderate, and low factors each have a score. So it will depend on where your site falls in each of these categories, how many points you'll give it for each one of those things. And then when we're done, we'll add those points up and those points will either be over a certain amount will be high risk, another amount will be medium risk, and the lower amounts will be low risk. So uh, it, it's gonna be good to have this uh, sheet with you when you fill out the other form to uh, actually get a pretty good idea of what the site is. Now, a thing that I do want to caution you on is that uh, these some of these uh, these factors on here are probably done by our professional knowledge and our uh, expertise. So we want to err on the side of caution, I think. Uh, if, if I'm unsure of what one is or the other, I will usually go to the higher number just to give myself uh, the benefit of a doubt. Uh, it, some of these things will be ver, uh, very obvious, like size will be very easy. The drainage, the leachate will be a little harder. Rainfall will be really easy and accessibility will be easy. So, but I, I, I caution you to uh, err on the side of caution if you're just doing a point score uh, from the assessment factors on the sheet here. Okay, so when we fill out the sheet, when we get done with all the points that are on there, if the, we have 35 points or more, it's going to be a high hazard. If we have 20 to 34 points, it's going to be a moderate hazard. If it's 19 points or less, it's going to be a low hazard. It uh, it's it seems kind of like uh, ironic, but a lot of times when we do these or we have a site, they end up at right at that number. And uh, you know the numbers are are uh, the numbers. Uh, you know, you could say 19 points, and it could be a low hazard, but in your mind, you got to think that if it was just one more point, it would be a moderate hazard. So um, these numbers are just numbers for reference. Uh, you can uh, char characterize your site how you want to or what you want to look at, it. but uh, the, the numbers are 35, 20 to 34, and 19 or less. And it's nice to have a reference because uh, that way you can uh, prioritize your sites. Uh, most of the time it's not, if you have a site that's 50, say, it's pretty obvious that it's gonna be a high hazard. If you have a site that's eight, it's pretty obvious that it's gonna be a low hazard. I have found that most of the sites fall into the moderate hazard category from 20 to 34. So I think after you, you do some of these and uh, characterize a few of the sites, you'll find that most of them do fall in that moderate hazard category. Okay, so field screening and ranking the dump site. So field screening, if you have more than 30 points, uh, it's recommended that you do a field screening of the site. In other words, do some uh, some screening for some samples if you have a 30 points or more on your site. Okay, another thing that we want to look at when you're doing an open dump assessment, uh, because the ultimate goal of an of the open dump assessment is to be able to clean that dump up and to make it look better and to stop the threat to the environment or the uh, tribal citizen living near the dump. So we want to look at the closure difficulty rating of the site, why we're out there assessing the site. Um, and some of the issues that you look at are, is it on tribal land? Is it on individual ownership? Are there multiple owners? Is it level out there? Is it really sloping or is it really steep? These factors are assigned points also and the number of points when they're added up, if the points are over a certain amount, you will have a, a, a much more difficult process to clean them up and it'll cost a lot more. So uh, another thing here on the closure and difficulty ranking is that the size of it, the size of it, the bigger it is, of course, it's gonna get more points. Uh, it's gonna get more points by what's in the dump and how uh, you, much you have to pay to haul off the contents. So all of these factors add up to points. And once you add those points up, if you get a total of 20 points, you will know that it's gonna be a difficult closure and you won't be able to close as many dumps. If you had five 20 point dumps, you could only close as many of those as you could 10, 10 point dumps, if that makes sense to everyone. So your closure difficulty rating 
if it's over a total of 20 maximum points, you know you're not going to be able to, to do a lot of the dumps on cleanup because of just because of the process that's involved and the cost that's involved to clean up the dumps. A lot of these dumps are on super difficult terrain. They're really steep. They have a lot of material. Uh, it's hard to get equipment down in there. They're in the middle of nowhere, and it, you know they charge by the hour. And so all of those factors will determine how much money or how much of your uh, funds that you have to clean each up one up. So these are some of the things that you can look at when you're doing an assessment. Say, hey, man, this is going to be really hard to clean up, or this is going to be really easy to clean up. Uh, so those are some things that you can take with you when you leave and put on the uh, assessment that, hey, I think we could clean up this dump pretty easy, or I think this dump's going to be really difficult. Maybe we can only do two dumps this time. So uh, just remember that, look at the closure difficulty rating because those are some of the same characteristics that you'll get from your assessment you'll be using for the closure difficulty rating. So why not do the closure difficulty rating while you're there also? Okay, conducting a site visit. If we were having this class in person, we'd be doing a site visit and we could look at these things. But today, I'm just going to talk about some of the things you might see at a site visit. And then when we're done with the presentation here in a few minutes, I'm going to do a small exercise of some different sites that we've looked at and to score those with you as we go through it and kind of give you an idea of how we rank them as a score instead of going to a site as a class we'll go over some of the ones that we've done in the past and give you an idea of how we scored them so but let's just go over a few of the uh things we're to do if we did visit a site uh of course, you all know that taking pictures is one of the number one things you always do when you go to any site for any of your work. Uh, you want to take pictures from all directions. You want to take pictures of the materials of concern and special conditions at the site. You know, pictures, pictures, pictures. We had a guy that worked here one time, and he always said there's no such thing as too many pictures. And he was we we hated to tell him, but he was always right. You can't uh, take too many pictures. Uh, now, with the cameras that we have, the phones, drones, uh, there's really no reason not to have enough pictures of every site. Okay, so when we go to the site, we get out our assessment survey form. We're going to collect our GPS location. Uh, first thing we're going to do. Then we're going to locate any residents. We're going to check for drinking water wells. We're going to locate any surface water, and we're going to note how easy the site is to get onto or get off of uh, those are some things that are pretty obvious but at the same time in some of the things like the distance to surface water and the drinking water wells those are things that hey we can check when we get back to the office on a map or with gps so the main things that you want to look at when you get out there is get an accurate gps location because if you get the accurate location there are a lot of things that you can do on these sites back at the office on the computer uh, just from the accurate GPS location. So I, I would say that the most important thing on the dump side is to get the accurate GPS location. Then you can do a lot of the other uh, assessments uh, when you get back to the office. Okay, so you want to scan through the trash for hazardous or special waste constituents like uh, drug lab waste. Uh, and by scanning through the trash, I don't mean going through every piece of trash on there, and I don't mean picking up sharp or in, uh, uh, glass or anything like that. Uh, you know, just we usually just wear a pair of gloves and just poke around on the trash and look and see what's in there. Sometimes it, stuff is obvious, sometimes it's not. If it's not obvious, don't. I, I'm not uh, saying to dig through the trash and get on your hands and knees and use a shovel to dig through the trash to find out what kind of waste it is. But some of these things will be obvious to you when you go out and just look for the obvious thing. Uh, you know, look at some of the dates on the food packaging. Uh, beer cans all have uh, dates on them now. Food packaging, you know, uh, cereal boxes always have uh, uh, dates on them. Uh, you know, look at uh, for newspapers, look for, for junk mail. You know, people always throw their junk mail out. It's crazy. Uh, there's always addresses and uh, people's names on the junk mail and uh, it, it's pretty easy to find. Uh, I think, uh, oh, it says born on dates with beer cans instead of beer cans. <laughs> I think that uh, you'll see that uh, it's pretty obvious to uh, find the dates on there. It's pretty easy to see if the dump is really active or inactive.
OK. So after you're done at the dump site, you want to go back to the office. You want to use GPS to layer the dump site over a topo map or an area photo. And it's the easiest way to determine the distance to surface water, drinking water wells, residences, and cultural significant areas. And then you can determine the land status by contacting your real estate office and or your tribal maps that you already have. Okay, so when you get back to the office, you're gonna complete your dump survey assessment. You're gonna enter that dump site data into the database. So you're gonna get back on WSTARS and you're gonna update it or actually put a new site into WSTARS. Okay, so I just wanted to touch, uh, I know I don't know who all, you know, uses GPS or GIS, uh, you know, at one time, we uh, were, we used GPS uh, and GPS, uh, GIS uh, equipment a lot more than we do now. I think now we just kind of fall back on our phones to give us GPS and or, uh, you know, a quick reading on that. Uh, but the GPS is really accurate. And uh, I think that you should try to use the GPS on all the sites. I know that some people still use section, township and range, but if you can get an actual GPS location, it's a, it's a, so much more accurate on these dump sites. Uh, also, you when you write down the GPS locations, you want to be as thorough as you can as getting it down to the smallest size you can. Uh, I know that you want to use uh, down to the smallest minutes that you can and the seconds that you can on there. Uh, the surface area and the volume are also easily determined when you get back to the office on GPS. That's another thing that uh, we have found that uh, if you're having a hard time with the volume or the uh, actual surface area, bring it back to the office, put it on the GPS, and then you can figure it out uh, from that a lot easier, a lot faster. Uh, that's just what we talked about a minute ago. And uh, you can also transfer that information to uh, GIS. Uh, we he here at, at Cherokee Nation, we have a, ma a maps of, of every dump site that we've characterized. Uh, we put it on a map, uh, the jurisdictional tribal uh, reservation area. And so we know where all the maps are by putting the information from GPS onto GIS and making maps for it. So it's a really good uh, tool to use. This is just some more examples of some of the maps and some of the things that you can do or that we've done with the GIS and GPS uh, from the solid waste sites. And you can compare the solid waste sites also to your tribal uh, properties that are on there. And it gives a good idea to, to uh, administration and or uh, tribal citizens if you're trying to show them where it is compared to the tribal properties. Okay, we already talked about this, using the GPS to do the distance to surface water, the nearest residence and drinking water well. So here's kind of a, a just a quick picture of it. You know, you can go up on the measurement tools and you can measure uh, how far it is from that dump there to the creek. You can see on that picture there that the dump is really close to the to a uh, waterway and really close to a house. And you can measure it and you can use the measurement tool on there and you can get on there and measure it. You know, just by eyeballing it, you can tell it's pretty close. But when you use the measurement tool on GPS or GIS, it can tell you the exact number of feet. Just by looking at this dump, though, it's pretty obvious that it's close to a school, it's close to a house, it's close to a creek. Uh, so going back to the office and looking at it on the topo map might have been a lot better than, uh, or at least helped with also after we'd already looked at it, to come back and look at it like this. And then to measure it on the GPS would give us a really pretty good idea of the dump having some effect on the human population and the environment on this dump. And you can do the buffer wizard. It just tells you how far it is to each website, uh, well, or the creek. So we already talked about this. Um, let's talk for a second about personal protective equipment when you go to a dump. So the personal protection that we use at a dump site is level D PPE which means steel toed work boots, heavy duty pants, you know, a uh, long sleeve shirt and work gloves. Uh, these are the only things that we require. Uh, 
that are required. I mean, you can wear more. I, you see the picture here on the right. Uh, I really don't think that uh, you need all of this to go to an open down. And uh, I think that uh, just common sense, uh, you know, boots and gloves for most dump sites was, would be appropriate PPE. People ask me all the time about what PPE they should use. And, uh, you know, I, I think that steel toed boots and gloves and, and uh, of course, long pants would probably be sufficient for almost every site that we do. Uh, <clears throat> site safety is another thing. Uh, some of these things are common sense, but I just want to go over it for a second. Never assess the dump site alone. Uh, at least take somebody with you, have a cell phone, and because sometimes the cell phones don't work out there too, or somewhere these dumps are. And I'll have a radio and have have first aid with you also. Invariably, somebody usually gets cut or scratched, and it's usually me. Uh, so uh, have your first aid kit also available because uh, some of the dumps, most of the dumps are in remote locations. And so it's always good to be prepared before you go out. Also, animal snakes, mosquitoes, ticks, and dogs. Uh, the number one thing here is, is a mosquito and tick spray. If you go out here in Oklahoma, in this part of Oklahoma in the summertime, and you go way out in the woods somewhere and you don't bring mosquito or tick spray, uh, you're just asking for trouble. Uh, the number one thing that we check on all of our trucks at the first of the spring and the summer is mosquito and tick spray. Uh, open dumps are notorious for uh, snakes, mosquitoes, and ticks. So just uh, be careful, uh, look out for those things. Dogs, you know, I put that on there because sometimes they they're out there, but they're not there to me. I'm not near as scared of dogs as I am mosquitoes and ticks. So, uh, just be prepared when you go out, make yourself a kit before you go out uh, a uh, open dump assessment safety kit before you go out and put it in each vehicle. That's what we do on our. That wasn't a dog at an open dump. Thank God. Uh, that snake looks unhappy, but I think it's because he has a big hole in his, in the middle of his body there that someone's done to him. So he probably made him pretty mad. He got ran over by a bulldozer. You can see the giant track on there. So that's what happened to him. So, but th he was at, this was actually a snake at a dump site though. So they are out there. And here's another one, your favorite buddy, the copperhead. Okay, so open up assessment site safety. Uh, you want to make sure you have permission to be at the site. When you go out to a site, you don't want to just uh, track onto someone's private property and start assessing it down. Make sure that you have uh, uh, permission to go out there. If it says no trespassing or private property, please make sure that you get permission of the landowner before you go out. Even though they might want to clean it up and they're asking for your help, still have them come with you or give you written permission to go to the site. Uh, a lot of times you go to a site and the neighbors will call or somebody will say that someone's trespassing. So please get permission to all for all the sites before you go to them, no matter uh, what someone has asked you to do, get permission in writing if you can, if not have them go with you when you go out there. Um, site safety, use your best judgment. Does the site look safe? If it's unsafe and it's unstable and it's on a, really steep incline, you might just try to have to try to skip it. You don't want to go out there and fall down or hurt yourself. So use your best judgment on a site. Some of the sites are just unsafe. Okay, just one quick thing I wanted to throw in here on tires, and this is just for the people in Oklahoma. I, I don't know about New Mexico. I, I didn't have a contact, but uh, if you find tires at your site, you can call for Ella March at, or email her at the DEQ.gov. And uh, she's the environmental program manager for the used tire program. And she can find ways for you to dispose of the tires. I know that we all have open dumps that have tires in them and we all want to get rid of them. So if you have tires on your dump site, call for Ella and see if you can uh, uh, pick her brain on what you might be able to do with the tires that you find. Because tires are the number one thing that you get calls on from sites. Uh, people that uh, want to get rid of tires. There's nothing that uh, that uh, piques people's interest more than having a bunch of tires on their site because they're afraid they're going to catch on fire a lot. So, 
if you have a tire problem, email Farella at the DEQ. Okay, so I know that was a pretty quick overview of the assessment and the sheet, the worksheet. Uh, like I said, I didn't put the worksheet on the uh, presentation actual worksheet. Uh, I will send it to you in the mail or on email if you need it. Um, or you can get on the IHS website and get a blank sheet also. Um, I wanted to kind of get done with that presentation in an hour so we can go over some of the examples from uh, some of the ones that we've done before. Are there any questions from anybody on what we've talked about so far? Uh, this is Kathy Well from Wyandotte. It's not a question, but it, some information for like on the uh, tires. Um, if you contact Corella Mark, she'll get you in touch with in Oklahoma with a lady named Kelly um, Dillo, and then she'll give you an S number. You have to have an S number um, for them to be able to come and pick up your tires and stuff when you work through the state of Oklahoma. So she'll get you in contact with a lady named Kelly Dillo. Okay, hey, thank you, Kathleen. I appreciate that. Any other questions from anybody? Sean, um, Vivian had a question. Where can we find the score sheet? But I think you answered that question for her. Yes, you can find the score sheet on the uh, just uh, type in on your computer. Uh, I just uh, opened up assessment score sheet. It'll pull up there or I can send it to you on email. Um, we can also post it on the ITEC website, could we not, Karen? If we wanted to somehow? Yes, yes, yes I believe we can. So, we, yeah, we can do that for you also. Any other questions or comments? Um, if there's not <laughs> any more questions for Sean right now, we're going to take about a five minute break. So, um, Sean can get his um, exercise ready. So, we're going to get off here for just a couple of minutes and uh, then we'll be back just shortly.
OK, I think it's been about 5 minutes, so we will go ahead and get started again here in just a 2nd. As soon as Sean gets back on the line and um, if anybody has any questions after the fact, you can always email me and I'll be happy to forward them on to Sean or you can unmute yourself uh, or you can put it in the chat box. And um, if you're calling in, please send me an email and let me know that you were on the call today so I can add your name to the attendee list. And with that, I think I will turn it back over to Sean. All right, thanks, Karen. Um, so, uh, usually on the class in the afternoon, we usually go out to a site for a couple hours and look around at us uh, and do our own assessment. But uh, since we can't go to the site, I I got five examples of uh, of assessments that uh, were done in the past, and I just wanted to go over five different, totally different uh, dump sites with you guys and uh, show you. Uh, some of the characteristics of the dump and to show you how each site is totally different, but each site has a different score. And I think that you'll be surprised when we get done with the exercises. Uh, when you first look at the sites, you'll think, uh, hey, I think it's gonna be this kind of score and it ends up not really being that score. So uh, I tried to pick five sites that were totally different to give you an idea of uh, why you wanna do the score sheet so uh, let's go through these. And if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to ask me. Uh, if I, if you need me to uh, go slower, let me know. Uh, but uh, these are sites now that uh, have been done in the past. Uh, some of the sites are here, and some of the sites are from tribal sites. So uh, let's go to site number one. Okay, this is just a picture of dump site number one. As you can tell, this is something that you see quite often. You see municipal trash, you see a bunch of mattresses. Everybody likes to throw mattresses out, uh, old uh, toys. Uh, you see a few drums in there too. Uh, I see I see three or four rusted old drums, and then I see some uh, household appliances uh, and a couple computers. This is the kind of stuff that you see most of the time when you go to a dump site. I know that. Everybody that works in environmental has seen an open dump just about. This is something that you see quite often. This is a very common looking dump. I look at this dump and I think, yeah, that's a pretty medium sized dump if I'm looking at one. It's not small, it's not super large, it's a medium sized dump. I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, hmm, it's pretty level too. I don't see a lot of uh, slope to it and I don't see uh, anything around it as far as like, uh, houses and I don't see any kind of uh, controlled access either. So let's go to the score sheet and see what we put on this one. All right, there's a couple of, uh, more pictures here of the same dump site. Okay, so as far as the contents go on this, we'll, we'll start at contents first. Uh, the contents on there, uh, it's not, uh, it's just household waste. It's not uh, any kind of uh, hazardous waste and it's not any kind of uh, combination waste. So uh, if it's just uh, solid household hazardous waste, it gets a zero points on the contents. The size of the dump is 95 square, uh, square yards. Uh, so 95 square yards on the size. I'm looking at the sheet now. This is the sheet from the presentation that I gave earlier. Uh, the size of the dump, is 95 so it will get two points for 95 if it was uh if it was 50 to 200 it would get four points and it was over 200 it would get 10 points so we have zero points for contents we have two points for size so here's a picture of the uh, site on a topo map as you can see it's relatively flat where it's at there is some slope there I don't see any houses on there. I do see a small pond south of there, but I don't see any drinking water wells and I don't see any residences at all. So uh, those factors will probably be pretty low when we do the rest of the score sheet. Here's another picture. It just shows that it's 390 feet to the uh, 
water source there or to the surface water body. So the distance to the nearest residence is 452 feet. The distance to the surface water is uh, 390 feet. So we're going to get 10 points for the distance to the surface water. So if we look at our chart, uh, less than 1,000 feet is going to be 10 points for the surface water. So we're going to get 10 points for that. The site drainage, uh, the site drainage on here is just moderate drainage, limited ponding. It's not super steep, but it's not totally flat. So we're going to give that two points. The yearly rainfall, 21 inches. 21 inches is uh, on the rainfall chart here, two points. Less than 10 inches is zero points. More than 25 is four points. So we're getting two points for that. Unrestricted access to the site, four points. So we add all those points up. We get 20 points for that site. As we all know from what I've talked about earlier, 20 points is a moderate hazard. So the dump site looked pretty big. There's, it's not small, but it's not really large. It's pretty close to a surface water source, but all the other uh, aspects, it's pretty not close to uh, any of the other things. So it's a 20 point moderate hazard. I know that uh, we all kind of have our own idea of what the sites would be. And I don't know if you guys thought this would be a moderate hazard by looking at it. But if I went to this site and I looked at that dump, I would probably think it was a moderate hazard just by looking at the size of it and uh, how isolated it was and how it was uh, really not close to anything. Uh, a dump that size, if it was close to uh, more uh, water source and closer to people and closer to homes and closer to uh, a tribal sensitive area would be a lot more points for a dump that size. But uh, it being so far away from all those, we get 20 points for a moderate hazard. Okay, this is dump site number two. As you can see, uh, it's a lot steeper here. It looks like some of the trash is older in this. It looks like a lot more special waste in here, which we call household uh, appliances, but they are kind of rusty. I do see some plastic that looks kind of newer. So this dump might be kind of a combination of the two. It might be some older trash mixed in with some newer trash. Uh, but it does look to me like it is a lot steeper, uh, so it would be a lot more conducive to runoff. It does look like it's uh, pretty rural and pretty not close to, uh, you know, cultivated land or maybe houses. We can look at the map here in just a second and see if we're right on that. But uh, the thing that stands out to me on this dump side is just the steepness of the terrain, and I think it would to everybody that's looking at it. The steepness of the terrain and the actual contents of it seem to be mostly old, rusty uh, appliances. So here's a little closer picture of some of the uh, uh, municipal waste that's in it. So let's kind of go over a few of the things that are on here. The contents, there wasn't anything hazardous in there, so it's going to get a zero points on that. But the size of the dump, look at the size of this dump. It's 500 square yards. So on the, the size of the dump, on our chart, if you look at the size, uh, it's going to get a 10 points for 500 uh, square yards because that's a large dump. So we're going to give it zero points for the contents because there's no hazardous waste, but it's going to get 10 points for the, the size and the surface area of it. So here's a picture of the dump from the uh, GIS, and you can see how far it is from the surface water. It is uh, 1,901 feet, so it is a long ways. It's very steep there, and there is a potential for runoff, but the distances uh, are so great that it would probably be unlikely to go that far. Uh, and the nearest residence, as you can see on this, is 3,467 feet. So this dump is really in a rural location, a long ways from a residence. So we're not going to get a very good score for the distance for the residents or for the surface water body on this one. Okay, so distance to the drinking water source, I just showed you. We're going to get a zero on that because it's almost 2,000 feet. We're in the same yearly rainfall that we have here in Northeast Oklahoma. It's always going to be usually two points. The site drainage gets the uh, maximum amount, which is eight points because of the steepness of it. And of course, there's no uh, access, it's unrestricted, so you get four points for that. 
So this site also is a 24 point moderate site. But if you didn't notice from these points and the way that we scored it, most of the points from this site come from the size of the dump alone. If you took the size of the dump away, uh, it would have hardly any points because it's so rural and so far from anything. So this dump was 10 times bigger than the first dump, but both sites get almost approximately the same ranking on the hazardous ranking, as you can see, because of uh, the way we rank it by where, how close it is and what effect it can have on health in the environment. So uh, don't let the size of the dump fool you. Uh, I know I've said it like three times now, but be more concerned about the uh, potential the site has to affect the environment and the human population. So, as you can see, those two dumps are totally different look and size and feel, and yet they're almost the same exact score on the score sheet. Okay, dump number three. Uh, this dump has a lot more municipal waste in it, as you can see. It's a lot newer looking dump to me. Uh, you can see that there's a lot of uh, sacks, a lot of uh, cans that are not rusted. Uh, to me, if I was looking at this dump, to me it looks like a lot newer, um, very active dump here. And you can also see on here that it's a pretty large dump. But to me, there's hardly any rusted uh, materials on this dump or anything old looking, so it looks like a pretty new dump. It, it, there is some slope to this site, but it's not uh, as sloped as the last site. And it does look pretty rural to me and pretty un, uh, un, uh, access, uh, easy access and uncontrolled also. So let's take a look at our, uh, our uh, score sheet here. The contents didn't have any hazardous waste in there, mostly municipal waste. So it's uh, going to be at zero points. But look at the size of this dump, 2,904 square yards. So it's going to get the maximum amount, 10 points. And that's something that we talked about when we first saw the dump. The first thing that jumps out at you is this is a large dump. Okay, so here's a picture of the, uh, of the uh, topo map for that dump. And you can see that it's only 882 feet, 881 feet, I should say, to the nearest house. Uh, so it's pretty, it's not far, but it's also not super close. The distance to a uh, drinking water source is uh, 4,389 feet, which is a, 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 a quite a distance. But I will tell you that the drinking water source there is where the whole city of Tulsa, Spavanaugh Lake is. So if it was closer, it would be a lot higher score. Okay, so let's look at the uh, score sheet. The distance to the uh, drinking water source, 4,389 feet. If you look on the chart, uh, it falls into the uh, five point category on the distance to surface water. From 1,000 to 5,000 feet, it gets five points. So that's gonna be five points. 23 inches of rainfall, same amount we had on the other two almost. You're gonna get two points to that. And the site drainage is uh, gonna get two points also because it's medium drainage and it's unrestricted access for four points. So, the score for this site is 23, which is moderate. It's actually one point less than the last site that we did, and it's only two points more than the first site we did. And this site is 2,904 square feet, and the first site was only 95 square feet. So, back to my point about the size that I talked to you, uh, to everybody about earlier. Uh, this site is a really big site but it just happens to be in a location that doesn't, uh, isn't conducive to a high score on the score sheet. Uh, it's, uh, you know, 20 times bigger than the first site, but yet it has the same score, a moderate score, because uh, it's got a lower uh, probability of affecting the environment and the health of humans. So uh, it's just, I'm just trying to point out the difference in the different sizes of these dumps and how they can, be totally different, but have uh, basically the same score on the score sheet. Okay, so dump site number four. This is a real unassuming dump site. As you can see, it's pretty small. There's mostly old uh, rusted uh, pieces of metal. Uh, I see one computer sitting in there, an old busted up barrel, a plastic kid swimming pool. 
Uh, it's very unassuming dump. You just look at it and you think, ah, oh, that's not much to that. But looks can be deceiving. So let's go to the next slide. Here's another picture of it. You can just see there's there's some little uh, household drywall. Uh, might be considered special waste, but more than likely it's just uh, drywall. Uh, so let's look at this site uh, on the score sheet. The size of it's 43 square yards. That's nothing. 43 square yards, as you know, is, can fit in your office. Uh, it's only going to get two points. I uh, didn't see anything in there hazardous, so it's going to get zero points on contents. So on the first sheet here, we only have two points for that dump site. And you can see on here that the uh, distance from this site to the nearest home is uh, only 62 feet. So uh, by that, you know that we're going to get a bigger score for a house being that close to the site. Uh, here's another picture of the site that you didn't see when you were looking up on the outside. And there's actually a cave underneath this dump that people dump trash into. Okay, so the distance to the surface uh, drinking water source is only 56 feet to that well of that house next door. By being 56 feet away, it gets 10 points on the score sheet. It also gets two points for the yearly rainfall. But here are some bigger factors that fall in for this side here. It's something that you would never see just by looking at this dump, casually looking at it from the from the ground surface. It's only about 100 feet from a tribal significant cave that has an endangered species in it. So it gets 10 points for being that close to the cave or being in the cave that has the endangered species. It's also located in, in a natural sinkhole. So its probability to leachate gets the highest score also, and it has unrestricted access. So the 47 square foot unassuming dump that we saw four slides ago gets 34 points on our hazard ranking, and it gets a high hazard. So it's the highest hazard site that we have assessed at the four dump sites that we've seen so far. I don't know about everybody that's watching, but if I was just walked by this site and I saw it compared to the last dump site, I would think there's no way this site could score a score that much higher than the other dump site. So it just goes to show you that as far as we're concerned, the size doesn't matter. We're looking at the effect of the health and the human environment and the tribally significant factors on this site here really increase the score on the dump sites. So uh, back to my original point is that uh, check the sites well, Look at any information that you can get at the site. Go back, look at your maps, look at your tribal uh, uh, historical information, look at your tribal endangered species. All of these things will help you get your score uh, on these sites correct. I think that uh, just going out to a site and, and looking at it and just saying, oh, it's not very big, it is a uh, pretty uh, not the way to do a site. Uh, look at all the factors that are involved. And I think that uh, some of the dumps will fool you, totally fool you by the site scores that you will get. Okay, so that's four totally different sites. Let's look at one more site. Uh, this is a small dump. You can tell by looking at it. Uh, mostly, uh, you know, there's a lot of wood and uh, a few chairs uh, and a mattress maybe. But if you'll see in the background, there's also an oil sheen on this site. So I think you know where I'm coming from on this site. This is going to be a site that's totally different than the other four. Uh, this site has some potentially hazardous waste on it. We don't know what's in these drums. We see that there's an oil sheen on the ground. We see some it looks like oil, but you know we don't know for sure what it is without characterizing the dump. But if we're looking at this site, we're going to go ahead and give it our hazardous uh, dump score, which is going to be 20 points on contents. So on this sheet, the size of it is small. This is the smallest dump of all the dumps that I've showed you today. Only 20 square yards. Uh, it only gets two points. It's it's by far the smallest dump. But the contents on it could be potentially hazardous. So we're going to give this site a 20 for contents. You can look on here and it's uh, 1,474 feet to the nearest uh, residence, which is a long way. So it's not close to any residences. And you can see that it's uh, only 279 feet to the nearest surface water. 
So it's relatively close to that if it is headed this way. So the distance to the drinking water source, 279 feet, we're gonna get 20 points for that. Uh, 22 inches of rainfall, two points. Site drainage, it's pretty flat. So we're gonna give that a two point. Also, it's gonna be unrestricted access. So we're gonna get that four points. <laughs> so the score for this site is going to be 50 points. The highest score by almost twice of all the dumps that we've done is the smallest dump. But the distance to the surface water, the distance to the nearest home, and the contents being potentially hazardous make this site have the highest score of all of our sites. So I just wanted to kind of go through here. That's all the slides uh, to show you five different dump sites to show you uh, how totally different dumps can have totally different scores, um, how one factor can make the score go up significantly, uh, less factors can make the score go down significantly. Um, are there any questions about any, I mean, as far as the dump sites go, you know, it's some of the sites I didn't even go to, so I wouldn't really know any answers to any of the dump sites, but are there any questions about the way that we scored the sites or any questions about any of the uh, uh, assessment factors that we've been talking about today? Ron, this is Kathy, I have a question. Sure. Um, I know we're focusing on the, like the human health risk, you know, and risk to the environment. Um, what about um, like say risk to somebody that is grazing cattle nearby? And the reason why I say that is we had a site some years back that uh, the tribe leased land to a gentleman and it had a small pond on it and stuff and he started losing some cattle. The first one, he didn't think too much about it. Got to two, three, four, we got to looking around. The only thing that, you know, really was there was the grazing and the pond. We got to looking deeper and somebody uh, throwing batteries at the edge of the pond and then growth had come in over those batteries and drained down into the pond is what had happened. So what about um, off-site drainage potential? Yeah, yeah. I think that uh, uh, on something like that, even though it's not affecting the human health or environment, I think you could still say off-site drainage. Uh, you could say that's likely to contribute to the ground or surface water contamination and go ahead and give that eight points. You know what I'm saying? Okay. I'm, I'm not saying that it has to be, uh, I, I think that it doesn't have to be health for the human per se. Well, it essentially, it kind of is if, it, even if the cattle right. have died. In, in an direct indirect way, it is. Yeah. And yeah. that's why we use our professional knowledge on this, because we all know that if it affects uh, cattle or and or uh, any kind of cropland that people might eat also, it can also affect the health and human environment. So I, okay. I think that, uh, uh, like I said earlier, you'd want to err on the side of caution. I would surely give that site the highest score I could on uh, the uh, drainage offsite because it's obviously draining offsite. It may not be affecting a person, but it's draining offsite. And so it gives a potential for it to do that. And right. what we're looking at on this is potential because, you know, not all of these sites, the things that we say that we think they might do actually end up doing, right? It might take a, a really uh, crazy environmental uh, rainfall or, a, uh, you know, a fire or something. It might take some kind of act of God to get these sites to actually have all the things that we say that we find there actually move off site. But if we list those things, if potentially they are there, then we at least know if they do go off site. So that's a good point. Uh, it doesn't have to be for human also. It can be for any kind of effect that might indirectly affect us in the end. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Karen, I did see a question pop up on the the uh, the uh, chat, but I I think it was my question. And oh, then, was it your question? Yeah. So then, yeah, because I had I had put that same question up there, but then I didn't see oh, okay. it there no more, so I asked it in person. Oh, okay. Sean, also, there's a um, question from Jacqueline McClaslin, um on the chat box. Did you see okay. that one? Uh, no, I don't. But uh, can you read it to me? Sure. Sure. This may be more of an IHS question, but 
IHS representative mentioned yesterday in the TECO meeting that they filter out locations for funding if under one half acre. Will they take into account the hazards assessed from the point sheet before removing that dump site from being potentially funded? <laughs> okay, you're you're asking me a, a hard question, uh, but I do think that uh, maybe the half acre is a cutoff point. You know, you want to have the sites at least that big, and it, it kind of. Uh, but I do think that you would want to have your site ranked. I mean, if you turn if everybody turns in a, a sites that are half acre, uh, that's just a cutoff for the size of it. It's really not have anything to do with the potential. Uh, of the site or the hazard of the site, I, I would think that. You know, the really small sites might get weeded out because of the half acre uh, guideline, but any site that you did, I would think that you would want to have a ranking on it to be able to uh, differentiate your site from the other, because there's going to be a lot of sites that are half acre, you know, uh, a lot more than people think. Uh, but. I wasn't on the call yesterday and I haven't talked to the IHS uh, as far as that goes. So I'm really, I can't say for sure, but I would say that you would want to uh, have, you know, the size of your site categorized and also what you thought would be the hazard uh, ranking of that site. It just, to me, it would be something that would go hand in hand. I hope that answers your question. Uh, without talking to the IHS specifically about that, you know, I'm not exactly sure, but it, it only makes sense that, uh, you know, if you had your site size down, you would want to also have why, hey, why do I want to pick, choose this one out of all the sites that are out there or the ones that I have? Because we, we'll all probably have site, more than one site if we were going to do that, and we'd want to care, uh, categorize one site from the other or have a way of showing which site we would want to try to have looked at first. And, to me, a point system or ranking system is a pretty easy way to do it. You know, you can just show on paper, hey, look, this is my point. So uh, it's better than just you saying, well, I want my site done because I, I think it's important. Everybody thinks their site's important. So if we have some kind of something to put on paper, it really helps. I hope that answers your question. Are there any more questions or comments or um, Okay, Karen. I don't I don't see any other questions in the chat box, but again, if you have a question after the fact, um you can just email it to me and I can forward it to Sean or send it to Sean. And if you want that uh, score sheet, contact me uh, by, uh, you know, on email. My email is swest at cherokee.org or contact Karen. And then also Karen's going to put an attachment on the ITEC website uh, with the uh, score sheet on there. John, will you provide a copy of these slides for us? Karen, what do you uh, to kind of go back and review? Karen, um, what... Yeah, I can get with Sean afterwards and get the PowerPoint and the exercise from him. And if anyone would like a copy of it, please just email me and I'll be happy to send that out. And we're also recording today. So if, if, you, if you'd like to view the recording again later, um, let us know and we can make that available. It'll be posted on the YouTube page. Yes, so there's all kinds of ways to get a hold of the information. So don't give up. We will get it to you one way or the other. And I think that once you do the once you get once you do the score sheet a few times, it'll become uh, second hand to you. You'll know exactly what you're looking for. Uh, it's one of those things where it's the information is quite a bit of information at the beginning. But once it's like any kind of a sheet that you do after you do it a few times, uh, it'll be it'll become a lot easier for you. But if you do have any questions when you're working on a score sheet, feel free to contact me by phone or email, and I'd be glad to give you my personal opinion on what I thought too. So I guess if that's it, Karen. 
we'll uh, go ahead and uh, close the uh, webinar for today. Yep. Yep. Okay. okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining okay. us today. We appreciate it, and we'll talk to everyone soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. This was helpful.